My story of traveling begins in a little village in eastern New York State. It was a peaceful little town in the early 1840s. I was working as a blacksmith's apprentice then, and not a very good one either, I'm afraid. But my grandfather, the village smithy, had given me the job when my family moved west. And he was doing his best to teach me. The day my travel adventure began, the stagecoach came very slowly into the village. It had lost a rim from one of its rear wheels. And the driver pulled up before our smithy to get repairs. The stagecoach connected our village to the rest of the country. It brought us mail and goods and passengers. So when it was in trouble, grandfather and I dropped our work to get the coach on the road again. It's hard to remember now how important coaches were in our country's development. But we know that even way back in colonial days, the coaches and horses brought men together at inns, where much of our history was made. Because of coaches, roads were built all over the East. Until by the time when Washington was president, he could travel to all 13 states by land, though it was very slow. The wagon wheels I used to bring in when I was a boy for my grandfather to repair helped the farmers take their goods to town. Yes, those wooden wheels with metal rims built our country even before I was a boy. And my grandfather, like any good smithy, knew how to repair them. He had that coach wheel ready in short order, and I helped him put it on. Of course, some of the passengers thought we took too long. But the smithy was too important a man to be rushed. He was repairman, builder, and chief mechanic in those days. Time was important to travelers. A stagecoach could average almost eight miles an hour by hard driving, and the passengers and driver were anxious to be on their way. Then, just as he was about to start, the driver stopped, called me, and handed me a letter he'd brought from the West. The letter was for me, and that letter launched my travel adventure. It was from my family out west in Illinois, and it told me to start west and join them before winter, if my grandfather could spare me. When he read the letter, my grandfather just said, go. I tried not to show how excited I was, but I think he knew. In my room that night, I planned my trip. The shortest way was across the mountains and then on through Ohio. But I wasn't sure about crossing the mountains at all. They were rugged and high. And if I were to go alone, I'd need to be sure of my way. Or I'd have to find a family headed west that I could join. Many people had traveled that way when my father was a boy. And I'd heard of boys younger than I was who had crossed the mountains alone. But to me, it seemed too hard and dangerous. Farther south was the National Road across the mountains. The National Road was clearly marked and easy to follow, but it was much too far out of my way. If I were to go north, I'd come to the Mohawk Valley, a broad gap in the mountains. Through it ran the Erie Canal, connecting the Hudson River with Lake Erie. I decided to follow the canal west to Buffalo. I could leave the next day. I would ask the coach driver how to get to the canal. The next morning, the driver let me ride with him a ways, perched on the coach, rolling and swaying along. This was the way I began my trip. When we had traveled about half a day, the driver stopped the coach to let me off. 
the canal was seven miles away, across country. And I started out. As I walked, I thought about those new trains and wished I had money enough to ride one of them, at least part of the way. By the time I got to the canal, I was hot and tired. It was quiet and lonely, and I decided to rest before starting west. As I was lying there beside the Erie Canal, I heard something coming. I looked. Come on, Bill. Hey, yeah. And around the bend appeared a big barge, towed by a pair of mules. As I went to meet it, I saw the mules were being driven by the barge captain. He had lost his mule boy, and he offered me the job. I figured I might as well work while I walked. It wasn't hard, for the barge floated along easily. And the mules just followed the towpath along the bank. Sometimes the barge passengers would ride on top to see the sights. And I'd call out if I saw something ahead. I remember the first locks we went through. The lock tender partially opened the upper gates to let water into the lower level where our barge was. The water rose, bringing our barge up with it. When the water in the lock was as high as in the canal above, the upper gates were opened all the way. Then our barge could move on into the canal beyond the lock. And slowly the big barge moved through the narrow locks and out into the canal. During the trip I made on the old Erie Canal, we went through 83 of those locks. I walked a long way on that towpath, but I was earning my board and keep. When we reached Buffalo, the old captain came to shake my hand and say, good journey. I still had nearly 600 miles to go west, and he would soon be heading east again. I had seen pictures of Buffalo, a busy port on Lake Erie, with tall masts marking where sailing vessels lay at anchor along the waterfront. I found lake steamers on the waterfront, too. One of them I came upon was loading for a voyage west to Detroit. I asked the captain the price of the passage, but it was too expensive. The boat carried people and cargo, cargo from as far away as China, to be delivered to the inland country. I asked the captain to let me work my way. Taking that steamer to Detroit would leave me only a few hundred miles to Illinois. And riding beneath those smokestacks looked exciting. I was waiting on the gangplank when the captain decided he needed me as a fireman's helper. As I went below, the captain signaled to the pilot, ready to start. The big mooring rope was cast off, the signal was given, and slowly the piston began to move. Slowly, and smoothly, the little lake steamer pulled away from the dock. Below, in the boiler room, I kept the fire hot, stirring it or adding wood every few minutes to keep up the steam. Once on my time off, the captain let me go over the maps he used. He showed me how the boat kept to the southern coast of Lake Erie, stopping at Erie, Cleveland, Sandusky, Toledo, and Detroit. At these points, river traffic brought goods and passengers to the lake. All this inland country depended on water transportation. Some of it went north to the lakes. Other goods went south, to the big Ohio, and on to the Mississippi. On these rivers, huge steamers were used. Steamers big and powerful enough to move with or against the strong river currents. Smaller steamers were used on the Great Lakes, and ours was small even for a lake steamer. 
Because it was small, we could stay close to shore and pick up goods or passengers just about anywhere. And staying close to shore had other advantages, for often we had to land to load wood for our boilers. It took a lot of wood and a lot of work to keep the fire hot enough, to make steam enough, to drive the pistons. But by working as a fireman's helper, I earned enough money to ride the last part of my journey as I wanted. By steam train, a pioneer in the travel system that one day would tie our nation together. That was the way I got to Illinois in the 1840s. Yes, I remember well my travel adventure that began the day we repaired the stagecoach. It tells much of how Americans were traveling our vast continent when I was a boy. By stagecoaches, canal barges, pulled by mules or horses, small steamers on the Great Lakes, big steamboats on the Ohio and Mississippi rivers, and as other Americans moved still farther west, Long wagon trains were taking them as far as the Pacific. This was travel in our land when I was a boy in the 1840s.